There is so much more to see in Egypt beyond the Giza pyramids and the Sphinx. They're incredible, but you must make time for Luxor. Welcome back to Finding Gina Marie, where we share our lives as full-time travelers and the connections we make along the way. If you're new here, welcome. I'm Judy. And I'm Kevin. We saw so many cool sites when we were in Egypt that we just couldn't cover them all while we were still in country. So we're coming to you today from Cyprus. Beautiful Paphos. We split our month up in Egypt, beginning with Cairo and Giza, and then the last two weeks we spent in Luxor. Luxor has a way different energy than Cairo, so you definitely want to see both. But I would suggest that you go to Cairo first so that you can be pleasantly surprised when you get to Luxor. In this episode, we'll be talking to you about the differences between the West Bank and the East Bank so you can decide where you'd prefer to be. And at the end of this video, we'll give you the cost breakdown of everything we spent. We took a flight from Cairo to Luxor via Egypt Air, and that was an experience in itself. When we got to the airport, first thing we got confronted by was security. We actually had to go through scanners. And not only did we have to go through scanners, but as we were standing in this line, they pulled Judy out and said, no, you got to go to the other line because they want to separate by gender. Apparently after your bags go through scanning, then you also have to go and get padded down on each side. So they had a woman on that side, man on this side. It was more effort than we wanted just to make sure we could get our boarding passes. And of course, going through the scanner, they help you with the bags and they expect a tip. Our airline only allowed us to take a personal item on. There was no additional charge to check the luggage, but there was to bring it on board. Because we had to go through security before even checking our bags, we thought we were done, but we weren't. As we walked to the gate, we thought we had some time, but they actually wanted us to go through another security check there. So they started calling people an hour before the flight and make sure they could get everything scanned. You had to take off your shoes. Surprisingly, you did not have to empty your water. Right. And they also didn't look at your TSA bag of fluids, but it still felt more intense because it was also a pat down afterwards as well. Luxor is divided by the Nile River into East and West Banks. So where should you stay? We'll give you some details on what's better about both sides, but no matter which side you pick, it's still much less chaos than there was in Cairo and Giza. The one thing you'll need to note is that Uber is only available in Cairo. Yeah. So you are at the mercy of taxi drivers the entire time you're in Luxor. The East Bank is where the sun rises. And in ancient Egypt, that meant life. So most of the people populated the East Bank. And that's where the main part of Luxor is right now. That's where the big city is. That's where the hustle and bustle is, the more expensive hotels and all the fancy restaurants. It's also going to be where the cruise ships are docked. The East Bank has two main archaeological sites, Luxor Temple and Karnak Temple. We could only see Luxor Temple from the street because our cruise ship didn't make it through the lock in time. It was queued up behind other ships. and We just didn't have time to get off and do that other tour. There are also two museums, the Luxor Museum and also the Mummification Museum. Unfortunately, we ran out of time and weren't able to visit those either. We stayed on the West Bank of the Nile. It's a more laid back part of the city. It has a much more relaxed vibe and it's cheaper. So if you're on a budget like we are, it's a great place to stay. The Airbnb that Judy picked out was really nice. It was an apartment that had actually two bedrooms. We didn't need two bedrooms, but it had two. We had a nice sized living room, kitchen, dining room table in it too. And also there was a great patio as well. So if you hadn't guessed, the west side of the Nile is where the sun sets and that represents death. And so all of the archeological sites are mostly found on the West Bank. It's where the mortuary temples are, and it's also where the Egyptians built their tombs. The ancient modern local artisan village, the Medinet Habu Temple. There are also other archeological sites like the Valley of the Kings, the Valley of the Queens, memorial temples of Ramsey II and III, the funerary temples of Hatshepsut, and even the colossal menace. If you're staying on the West Bank, you can bump into archaeological sites very easily. I literally walked up to the Colossi of Memnon on my evening walks. In fact, I've even got a journal entry about it in Judy's journal, which is linked below. We just did a refresh of our website. We're adding more content to it. So leave a comment below for any articles or information that you want to see on that site. Where we stayed in Luxor is much greener than where we stayed in Cairo. 
There was a lot of dust up there. Here, we had our dust, but we also had a lot of farmland, animals. There were cows, roosters, there were chickens. Donkeys. We were already kind of used to the Muslim prayer that would wake us up at five o'clock in the morning, but we weren't quite used to the roosters that would wake us up at that hour as well. And they didn't stop at that point either. Sometimes during the day, just thought, hey, let's wake them up again. Maybe they're not awake at 2 p.m. So I don't think it actually hit me until we were in Cairo and we saw the Nile River. And I thought, this is the Nile River. This is amazing. And as I was looking for things to do in Luxor, I came across various Nile River cruises. Now, we don't typically take cruises, but I thought, this is a Nile River. Of course, we're gonna take a cruise. Typically, you can get them from Aswan to Luxor or Luxor to Aswan. By taking the cruise from Aswan to Luxor, it allowed us to keep our Airbnb, which is really cheap to have for each night. And that also allowed us to cut down our luggage. So we kept our rolling carry-on bags in the apartment and we just took our backpacks with us for the three night, four day tour of the Nile River. And we ended up staying in the Nubian village, which is an experience of its own. And we have an entire video to talk all about that. It's an incredible, colorful place, unlike any place we've ever experienced. The first morning that we got to Luxor, we woke up really early so we could take a hot air balloon ride. It was glorious, and it departs from the West Bank where we were, which was really convenient. You can also get there from the East Bank as well. Our video from last week covers everything you could ever want to know about riding in a hot air balloon. So follow that episode if you've missed it. And if you missed it, maybe you're not subscribed. So go ahead and subscribe now. One of the things to know about Luxor is everybody is a guide. And so you will be walking 50 feet and you will get people asking if you want a Faluka ride, if they can give you a taxi, if they can help you to set up a hot air balloon ride. Uh, yes, I'm good. No, thank you. I'm good. I'm all right. English. Yes. If there's any number of sites that they can take you to. For several days, we made sure we say no to all these because we had things scheduled already. But then one of the restaurant owners that we were talking to offered us sites that really weren't available on our Nile cruise. And so we said, yeah, sure, we'll go ahead and do that. Yeah, hello. hello, good to see you. Hi. What we didn't realize was that all he was going to be doing was providing transportation. There was no guide as part of this. The new house is the older people who go in the new house. There's many houses here before. We assumed that Part of the reason for the cheap price was there was an expectation of tips, but that wasn't the case. Let me clarify that. They wanted tips, yeah. <laughs> but they weren't going to be providing uh, any kind of tour along the way. So let's jump right in and discuss the three things that we did on this half day tour that really wasn't a guided tour. <laughs> it was, it was a, a, a taxi ride to other things that we might discover while we're there. The 20 US dollars that we paid to the restaurateur who was coordinating this taxi ride did not include any of the excursion costs. So we paid the entry fees on our own. The first stop by our taxi driver was the Valley of the Workers or Deir el Medina. This is the ancient Egyptian workman's village. And this is where the artisans and craftsmen that decorated the temples and all the tombs of the Valley of the Kings live. It was built in 1550 BC. They built and decorated their own tombs here, as well as the ones they did for the kings. One of the cool things is that this village is very well preserved, and they have hieroglyphics here that paint a very thoughtful picture of what daily life was actually like for them. There are also artifacts and writings that talk about the cures for scorpion bites, tomb robberies, price of goods, and more. It wasn't just the artisans that lived here. The, their wives, children, potters, carpenters, basket makers also lived here. Basically, it was an entire middle class that lived here in the mountains of this otherwise desolate city. When we paid the fee to get in, it allowed us to visit three tombs. And really, we could have gone more, but it was a very hot day and the sun was beating on us, there's no shade. So we were content to just see the three tombs that were offered for free. A lot of the archeological sites in Egypt don't really have signage to explain what you're seeing, but this place actually did. So if you have to not be traveling with a guide, you could get information from the signage. There was even a full section that was covered. You could walk up there, 
multi-scale models of all the different parts of these tombs. Different parts of Egypt have different things that they're famous for, and Luxor is really well known for its alabaster. So it was logical that we would go ahead and stop at an alabaster shop. Even if you're not interested in buying anything, it's still an interesting stop so you can learn how to spot genuine alabaster from fake. And in the shops, they do that whole routine where they'll hold the real pot up to a light, and if it glows through that, then you ooh and ah because it's real. Wow. There you go. <laughs> we were also shown in one of the shops some of the older pieces of alabaster that were passed down from other generations. And those rooms always had air conditioning and special lights, just so you knew that you were looking at something more unique than some of the other things in their shop. Which meant the price went up a little bit more. But at the same time, everything in Egypt is negotiable. There's not an expectation that you're going to pay the listed price. Now, in fact, our one guide said, if you're not negotiating, they feel a little bit insulted because that's part of the process. And if you offer a price that's too low, they just won't sell it to you. You can't really be harming them because they will protect themselves. And you can see here that even though it was just the two of us, they gave us our own private little explanation. After that, our taxi driver took us to our final stop, which is the Medinet Abu Temple. This is a mortuary temple, and it was built by Ramses III, and it was dedicated to the god Ammon. Built between 1187 and 56 BC, and excavations are still going on today. In fact, you'll find that a lot in Egypt. This is a less visited temple, but it shouldn't be. There are so many intricacies and hidden rooms to explore. We were fortunate that a guide, an Egyptian man, adopted us. He first offered just to take our picture, and then he got rid of the ticket-taking process and decided to become our friends for the next couple hours. We maybe made the mistake of not negotiating how much this tour was going to be, but we ended up giving him 700 Egyptian pounds at the end of it. One of the first things you'll notice is that this temple is covered in incredible hieroglyphics. A lot of them are focused on Ramses' wars. He was one of the most warring pharaohs in history. There are pictures of battle after battle, but the primary one depicted is with the Sea Peoples, and that was one of the major wars that Ramses III fought. Some of the hieroglyphics, especially the ones that are at the level that you, anyone can reach, are super deep. They're trying to prevent them from being scratched off or rubbed away. You can see how well preserved all of these images are, but it turns out that there is really no restoration that's been done here. All that they've done to maintain it is to dust it periodically. We got to see this dusting and cleaning process up close and personal because of our special guide, our buddy, that actually opened up some of the uh, locked areas where the people were in there actually doing the fine detail work of cleaning. So it helps if you have a guide. We're real followers. We would not have gone through the, the stanchions that were closing off those rooms. What was beautiful and really amazing is that you could still see a lot of the colors that were bright, especially where you could see stars and the blue, just the higher up areas where they really did some detailed painting. And this is what we're talking about BC, BC time and everything's still shining through. Unfortunately, one of the most disappointing things was that a lot of the surfaces have been scratched and defaced because of the Coptics. So the faces of Ramses III and also the god Amon were scratched away. Again, one of the convenient things about having a guide show us around is there's this whole wall of hands, and that was to signify all of the enemies that Ramses III had victory over. Kind of gruesome. Many of these buildings are so well preserved because the Coptic Christians were inhabiting them up until 9th century AD. We really were amazed at the incredible history that we got to experience, just all jammed into this half day. Judy wrote an article about this in Judy's Journal. You can read all about our experience there. Now, even though we were getting pitched to go on Feluca rides and taxis and everything else, we felt very safe. You could just say no and they would back off or would they say, welcome to Luxor, it's all very quiet, very nice, but they will keep asking you over and over again. I felt very, very safe. As I said, I took walks every evening. I was on the side of the road. I never felt unsafe. And in fact, when I would come back, all of the restaurant owners would wave to me and people were very friendly and it felt good. But just bear in mind that anytime you see somebody who asks, where are you from? That means they're introducing themselves so they can offer you something like a ride or a service or something else. We had a kid who had asked us to sponsor his baseball team. 
freaking way they were doing baseball. Soccer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> just, <laughs> they're not going to hurt you and they will leave you alone eventually as far as food goes we were very lucky the place that judy booked us was right near all these little restaurants that were very local lots of local food probably a little more touristy than some of the other places that were further up in town that we did try also but it was nice to create these relationships with these restaurants they're all very friendly they're all very helpful and if they didn't have something you always saw them kind of scoot out of their restaurant, like go get some food, bring it back so they can make it for us. It was also much cheaper than we expected. The food was delicious and you got a lot of courses. For dinner and lunch, you almost always got vermicelli rice and bolotti bread, which is the local bread in the area. Yeah, no lacking of starch in your diet here. And the food was cheap enough that we ate in restaurants versus cooking. It's fairly impossible to get breakfast before 8 a.m. But so long as you're after that, you can get any meal you want at any time of the day. So this is chicken curry, which has um, peppers and carrots, and what I think is maybe a spicy pepper. <laughs> so this main... Oh, classic. <laughs> classic. <laughs> well, we got that on video. <laughs> <laughs> and a bunch of... Um, Roasted sauteed vegetables, vegetables the sauteed, okay. some rice. I don't know if I'll have any of that, but... <laughs> um, and I've got the tagine. Chicken tagine. Chicken tagine. We really wanted a traditional Egyptian breakfast. So we did find a spot a little up the road in the, the more heart of the town that didn't speak English and served a lot of very specialized Egyptian food. It's your typical Egyptian breakfast, which includes fool, which is the fava beans, and then also pickled vegetables, and again, the bolotti bread, and of course, the traditional cucumbers and tomatoes, and also falafel. So it's a pretty hearty breakfast. Yeah. In this situation, they did not provide any utensils <laughs> and uh, no napkins or anything like that. But there was behind us a sink, and that's where we saw everybody wash up after they ate. Our favorite restaurant was actually Nile View, which was just five minutes away from our Airbnb, a stone's throw from the Nile River itself. A few restaurants offered hamburgers and a variety of different Italian foods, but we really pretty much always stuck to Egyptian food. One of my favorite foods was tagine, which is more like a stew of chopped up pieces of meat, the chicken or beef, or sometimes lamb or goat. It's slow cooked and it's named after the earthenware vessel that it's normally cooked in. And it comes piping hot. I mean, that thing is sizzling hot. Do not grab the bowl. We didn't particularly find that any of the alcoholic beverages like wine were very tasty. So <laughs> if you're expecting that, it's probably not worth it. Yeah, it's not the place for wine. <laughs> Nearly everything we did in Luxor or Egypt in general required Egyptian pounds, which meant that you had to go to an ATM and get your money out so you could spend it. The credit cards are rarely used. We use them on excursions, things we prepaid for, and hotels and even parts of a hotel one time, we had trouble paying for things. So make sure you have money. The only problem with the ATMs in Egypt is they give money out in big bills, like 200 pound bills. So when I was in Luxor, the machines were more generous than they were in Cairo and Giza. And I wasn't limited to like two or 3,000. I was actually taking out 6,500, 7,000 Egyptian pounds at a time. And that led to more big bills, which we had to break because you're paying for tips everywhere in Egypt. And when we were paying at restaurants, we didn't worry about getting an itemized bill. In fact, a lot of the places that we went to regularly, they didn't bother trying to write things up. They knew us, they would just throw out a number. It usually was a pretty good number. We trusted them. And so we just paid cash and didn't sweat the small stuff. We ended up paying a few extra Egyptian pounds. We were completely okay with it, but I really don't think that we got ripped off in any way in those situations. So let's go ahead and break down some of the costs of our expenses. So the first thing is that we paid 500 Egyptian pounds in order to get from the Luxor airport to the West Bank of the Nile. The entry fee for Deir el Medina cost 40 Egyptian pounds. The Medinet Habu Temple cost 100 Egyptian pounds. Plus there was a tip to the guide. Uh, one found us, so we paid him about 700 Egyptian pounds. For an experience of a lifetime. Yeah, it was a really good tour. And he got us into places that we definitely couldn't have walked alone. 
our Airbnb on the West Bank, which was generously sized, two bedrooms and a great patio, was $332.77 US dollars, which broke up to $22.18 per night, which is one of the reasons that we decided to keep it when we were taking our Aswan to Luxor cruise. If you decide to take the Nile cruise from Aswan to Luxor, you're gonna to need to get to Aswan somehow. So a taxi ride to the train station was about 200 Egyptian pounds. And then the train ride was 505 Egyptian pounds for each of us or 1,010 pounds total. And we actually paid for that on the train because it saved all the muss and fuss of trying to buy a ticket online, which was not working for us. And the driver who took us to Habu Temple and the Valley of the Workers, that cost 20 US dollars plus tips. So a light breakfast for us was poached eggs on toast, which was only 70 Egyptian pounds per person. We also got a continental breakfast one day that was 90 Egyptian pounds, and that con included yogurt and toast and a piece of fruit and a very thin omelet. So our morning essential cappuccinos were 40 Egyptian pounds for a single and for a double cappuccino, 55 Egyptian pounds. And if you're loving our videos, why don't you go ahead and buy us a cappuccino? The link's below. So all in for breakfast for both of us was typically around 220 Egyptian pounds. We would typically round it up to 300 Egyptian pounds or $9, which wouldn't even cover your cappuccinos in most places. Lunches and dinners cost us around 400 Egyptian pounds. That's for both our meals. And that includes a tip. We didn't know what to expect with Luxor after being in Cairo, but we thought, you know, we're on the West Bank. It's definitely going to be less crowded, less busy. Uh, the West Bank of Cairo was actually our Giza side, and that was really busy anyway. So when we got there and we had this quiet, peaceful environment with a lot of local restaurants that we just quickly walked to, it really was a completely different experience. We absolutely loved it, and we really would recommend it to anyone. Tourism is down and they would be very happy to have more U.S. tourists and tourists from anywhere come to visit them. Thank you so much for watching. Please give us a like if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing if you're not already. And make sure you check out FindingGeneMarie.com because Judy has a full article there on all the details that we talked about in this video. Until next time. Until next time. Middle class living in the mountains of this otherwise desolate city. Desolate what? A city. <laughs> city and village. <laughs> <laughs> Middle class was living in the mountains of this otherwise desolate bit. Come on. <laughs> Come on. <laughs>